I suppose sometimes we only come to realize that when we've lost part of it. But to be able to gather in a building such as this and to talk and visit and to associate with Christ Jesus is indeed a very good thing. I'm somewhat uh, like those Scroggins in that I know when you come together it's uh, some of the mixed emotions in that I'd like sometimes to come in and be quiet and approach God and worship in a quiet way, and yet I enjoy so much visiting together in the lobby and visiting together and having all that hum of association together. I've talked with brethren and business people about that. Some would come in and say, well, I'm going to come in and sit down and be quiet. But when you come in and sit down and be quiet, you miss all this listening together. So I'm very much aware of the fact that there's mixed emotions about having the fellowship and the association together and coming together and not quite a reverential attitude. And so I suppose the way to do it is to have all that and just get quiet and worship God. But it's good to be here tonight. I appreciate so very much the time that we've been able to be together. It's been a privilege and an honor to be in your midst this week and to associate with you and come to know you better. Some of you I've never known before this week. I feel I'm much closer to you because of your love of truth and your faithfulness in being here throughout the week. The fact that you had me in your homes and fed me, made me feel at home and very welcome, and made me feel as though you cared that I was here. It's been a joy to be with you and I trust and pray. The things have been said and done that have edified you and caused you to be closer to God. And that's really what I've attempted to do, whether it's been done very well or not. I always come to the close of a meeting with very mixed emotions. I'm always aware of the fact that an opportunity, a window of opportunity is closing. Maybe that there's some who have not read the gospel this week that should have. Maybe, had I been more attentive to detail, or maybe that I chose a different lesson, or done a better job than what I did that there may have been someone else who read the gospel. And I'm very aware of my shortcomings. And I pray to God to be able to use me and my shortcomings in such a way that glorify his name and teach his truth. And I pray that if you're here tonight and not a Christian, that you will surely think about the things that have been said throughout the week. As we've talked about the plan of salvation and the worship to God and moral living, and those things that help us to be of service to the cause of Christ, and that you will try to do the very best that you can in God's service. It's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. Pray for you the very best in the future as you face the future and try to serve Almighty God. It's very difficult to say what I feel about Dennis and Linda and the family. I know there's some of the captive audience right now and probably wish I'd just pass on this and not say anything. And yet I know how much I feel for him and love him and Linda and the family. I know from knowledge of Dennis and Linda and some of the things that they've done, the sacrifices they've made for the cause of proof. And I'm very aware that uh, a local man is sometimes not appreciated like a visiting preacher. And that's just the way that it is. Because I come and I go. And Dennis is here all the time. And yet, I appreciate him so very much, I know of no one who has a keener desire to serve God. A keener desire to know the Bible than Dennis. I believe Linda is indeed a helper in that. Uh, J.D. Tant wrote a book one time on the Gator did about his father, J.D. Tant, Texas preacher. And a lot of people who read that book were angry at J.D. Tant, not having met him. Because in the process of writing that book, Gator revealed a lot of things about his mother and his father, and how his mother seemed to have had to suffer so much to be a preacher's wife. And I must admit that having read that book two or three times, that I was somewhat of the opinion he abused his wife. And she was somewhat uh, taken advantage of. But I want to go where the Tant wrote the people, the J.D. Tant Texas preacher. Those were really the words of his mother as the gospel preacher. And not a word of complaint comes through. What J.D. Tant did in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did because his wife was with him 100% in the support of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I find that true of Linda. They're both qualified to be able to go out in the world and make more money, educational circles, and uh, do things other than preach, do the things they're doing, but they're committed to the cause of Christ and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I say this thing's not to embarrass them and not to embarrass you, but I truly really hope that you appreciate them for the cause of Christ and for the love of truth. And I want to say a special thanks to my Sandy because she gave up her bed bedroom this week for me. I appreciate that so very much. I 
know sometimes teenagers just don't want to get up their environment for somebody. She very willing to gave up her bed for me, and I appreciate that very much. I've been at home there, and they've made me feel very much a part of their family. You know, if we're not for fellowship in Christ Jesus, probably we wouldn't know one another. We come from different backgrounds, different parts of the country. As we talked this week, I found out how some of you obeyed the gospel. I found this in Yankees here. I found out there's some from south of the border here. And, uh, they, you know, they're just a mixture. As Daniel 2 prophesied, they would be. And we come together in Christ Jesus, and no barriers, there's better friendship and fellowship. A very special thing between Christians. We can come together and participate in the worship of God. And I've been able to do that just for a few days with you. So I appreciate it so very much. And I want to express my appreciation. And I know it's inadequate. I don't feel very capable of expressing how I feel in my heart about these things. But I feel very deeply for the association that you've given me, for the care that you've given me. I'm going to let you do that throughout the week. And all the other things you've said, the kindness that you've shown. And I want to express my appreciation. We're in the south part of Fort Worth, the Woodmont congregation of Fort Worth. And if you're there, I sure hope you'll come by and visit with us and let us proclaim just a little bit of that hospitality that, that uh, you showed me throughout the week. This is the last meeting that we're going to have in this series of meetings. And we want to try to do the best we can by encouraging you to think about how to properly understand the Bible. When you begin talking to people about how to understand the Bible, it's amazing how many people have such wide, divergent views about how to really understand God's Word. In our time, there's such a, uh, a, a significant amount of charismatic movement going across the country that many, many, many people would say that the way to understand the Bible is that the Holy Spirit speak to you. And there are individuals who would pause and try to hear voices, try to hear some inner feeling that would tell them what God's Word would have them to know or God's will would be. And many of them would not do anything without some supposed emotional guiding or leading of the Holy Spirit. There are those who would say, well, just let the Bible fall open and, and follow the verse that you find on the page. And that's all the head and best kind of thing. People certainly will not find out what God will really teaches. And when people have that kind of an attitude about the Bible, if they learn the truth, then surely it's an accident. It's not something that they just come upon because they've really studied the Word of God. I find people sometimes who are led by their inner emotions. That is, not, they don't claim to be the Holy Spirit, just the idea of their inner emotions. That they're going to follow what they feel. Sometimes they'll speak of as being their conscience. Sometimes they'll just try to let their heart lead them, not understanding what the Bible's heart really is. You go through all these various ideas, and people really don't understand what the Bible is or how they're going to understand the Word of God. I've known people who read their Bible daily, never understanding about the Word of God, really understanding it. A lady in Crockett, Texas, one time had a very dear cousin who was dying of cancer. And this woman read her Bible religiously every day. And yet she was no closer at all to the truth. And I observed her and the attitude she had in reading the Bible. And she read the Bible as an act of devotion. She found like a certain number of pages read each day would somehow accrue to her account in heaven. And she read the Bible somewhat out of an emotional sense without any kind of understanding that the Bible is saying things to me that I need to understand. And I persuaded a lot of people who read the Bible somewhat out of a superstitious idea. As we talked about earlier in the week, those who think that the Bible is somewhat like a talisman. And they believe that superstition exists in the world, that demonization exists in the world. And so they use the Bible somewhat as a, a war to keep the devil out of their lives or keep out of demon possession. And then there are those poor deluded, deluded souls who watch Jim and Pat. Jimmy Swagger. <coughs> and they may get an idiot's hold. Because anybody can be deluded by people like that. It's amazing the gullibility of people that can just be taken in by shysters. And people who are out for money want to fleece people. It's amazing that people who have no concept of Bible at all can claim to lead people the way the Jimmy Swaggers and the Jimmy Tammy Bakers, people like that will lead people through the years. Pilate asked Jesus, and Jesus stood before him, what is truth? Tonight I will explore with you what is the nature of truth. How do you understand the Bible? 
We've talked about some ways that really do not help you in understanding the Word of God. Tonight, I want to talk with you about understanding the Bible. I believe there are those who really don't ever understand or think they can ever understand the Word of God and know what it is that God wants them to know. But we come to the passages that I've used already this week in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4, where the Apostle Paul said, Where about when you read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ. Brother Turner told me one time that a woman ran up to him and gushed, Oh, Brother Turner, I'd give anything to know what you know about the Bible. And he said, No, you wouldn't. And she said, Oh, I'm serious, Brother Turner. I'd give anything to know about what you know about the Bible. He said, No, I don't think you would. And she said, Well, what do you mean? He said, Because if you really want to know, you can. What I found out, I read. And if you want to read, if you want to know what I know, read your Bible. That's essentially what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 3 and verse 4. Brother one, Ephesians 5 and verse 17, he said, Be not foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. I'm coming to you, my friends and brethren, with the hope and with the anticipation that you understand the will of God or that you can understand the Word of God. It is not incomprehensible. It is not something revealed to the elite. It is not something revealed to the clergy. It is not something revealed just to a favorite few. God has revealed His words so that every man and woman on the face of the earth has the capacity of understanding the Word of God and so guiding and ordering their lives by that Word of God so that you can spend an eternity in heaven. We need therefore to understand the will of God. You shall know the truth, Jesus said in John 8, 32, and the truth shall make you free. The conclusion there is that everyone can understand the Bible. Patient study over years has taught people that God is speaking to them and they can't understand the Bible and they can know the Word of God and know the truth. We need to understand that there are those who will try to take away the ability of people to understand the Bible. Even among our brethren, there are those who have looked at the ways that we have of understanding the Word of God and they're trying to say that you can't use those methods anymore. I don't make any bones about it, and I'm not ashamed to say that I believe we come to understand the Word of God by commands, by divine implications or necessary inference, and by approved apostolic examples. Those things, all three of them, are very much under fire, even among brethren in our day. There are those who are trying to say that that's not the real way to understand the Bible, and they're not really to give anything any better. But I want to look with you tonight at what the nature of truth is. I just suggest to you that there is something outstanding about the truth, that is, that it is objective, not subjective. Now, I don't really understand that. I'm not going to try to get into great definitions. I'm going to try to make it just so simple that even I can understand it. When you talk about objective truth, you're talking about truth that is outside of man, that originates from God, that is not dependent upon man for its revelation, for its inspiration or for its sustenance. The idea that there is something that is outside of man that is absolutely true, that does not, de not depend upon my permission or my agreement for it to be true. Now, a good illustration. We've seen from the space shots that the world is around. And they have what's called a flat earth society. Now, I think that's tongue-in-cheek. Although I'm persuaded that I know the people who have denied that the space shots really happen. They deny that anybody's ever set foot on the moon. But I believe you'll understand that when we say that the truth, that the earth is round, that's an objective truth. That is, it's true whether or not I believe it. It's truth even if I disagree with it. It's factual aspect does not depend upon anything that's in me. When we talk about objective truth, we're talking about truth that is true outside of me, whether I agree with it or whether I disagree with it, whether I even understand it or not, it's also true. In the application of that, in the spiritual realm, Jesus Christ is said to be, by the scriptures, the Word of God. There are those who deny God. There are those who deny that Jesus is the Son of God. But my friends, Jesus is the Son of God objectively in the sense he does not need my permission to be the Son of God. He does not need my agreement to be the Son of God. He is the Son of God whether I disagree or whether I try to spit in His face. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that's an objective thing. It doesn't depend upon me at all. 
When we talk about something being objective, we speak together from the standpoint that truth is given by God, independent of me. God didn't have to come to a council and ask whether or not we would agree for Him to give the truth. One of the great outstanding passages of the Bible begins in the 38th chapter of Job. After the foolishness of Job's friends, and some of Job, God says to Job, I've heard up the laws of your mind, and I'm going to ask you some things. And in essence, he says to Job, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you when I stretched the stars out across the heavens? Where were you when I made the great fish and put them in the sea? Where were you when I said in the ocean, you'll come here to this point, and you'll not go beyond that with your proud ways when we strayed at this point? Where were you, Job, when I did all of these things? And the point is, God didn't have to call a committee together to create the heavens and the earth. God didn't have to ask agreement for us to be created. And the fact is that that's a matter of truth. God just did that. So in the Hebrew letter, it is also true with the Word of God that God's Word has been spoken and God did not have to ask my permission to write the Bible. He didn't ask, have to ask me if I'm going to agree for Him to do so or would I vote on whether or not what He said was beneficial for me. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God who at various times and in divers ways spoke in times past of the fathers by the prophets has in these least of these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. The point is that God by fiat just simply did the thing. God did so because out of His own wisdom and by His own knowledge, He knew what He was doing. He didn't have to experiment. He didn't have to redo anything. He didn't have to ask permission. He didn't have to ask for help. God just did it. I understand that in the creation. What I need to understand is that that's true with the Word of God. God's Word is a product of God's divine wisdom. He didn't have to do that. So when it comes down to the Word of God, it is not subjective. That is, it is not human wisdom. It is not something that comes from within man. It is not relative. Now that's a humanistic ideal. Relative truth means, well, that's all right, it's true if you want it to be true. And because you stand over here, a thing may be true, but someone standing over there it may not be true. When Pat Boone began to travel around the country, one of his downfalls was that he went to France. And some of the preachers in France taught about Pat Boone how to drink. Now, they said back in America, we wouldn't drink. But over here in France, everybody does it. It's not a sin in France. So we can drink over here in France. My friend, I'm going to tell you, it's a sin to do it in America. It's a sin to do it in France. And this idea that perspective changes the matter of truth is just not true. Situation ethics has been created by people who deny objective truth. They deny that truth is truth whether it's Tuesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday or Sunday. And a lot of brethren sort of have the idea of a play from what I've observed and seen in the years that I've been preaching. That when they're in a local church arrangement where they are to be seen by their fellow brethren, they live and walk a certain respect life. But when they get off in some far distant land where they're not known by anybody, they'll drink and do anything else they're big enough to do because they can do it not be seen. Who do we think we're fooling? Do we think God is going to allow His truth to be Change by how many miles away from my home congregation I am? Do I believe that I can live a certain step life when I'm going to be seen by others and then walk off and when I'm not seen by those that I know? Do like I want to do? Does not reveal something about my heart that's not right with God from the beginning? From the, beginning? the point about it is that truth is not relative. Now, I recognize that there are some truths that are relative and I wouldn't deny that. I want to explain what I mean about that. You're either baptized or you're not. And that's an absolute fact. It's not a matter of relativeness. You are either a Christian or you're not. Now once you become a child of God, we're told to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you're going to find one person that's more along the line of maturity than someone else. The lady in Christ and the elder in the church are different ways along the path of maturity. But that has nothing to do with the relativity of truth. Because the baby of Christ obeys the same truth that the elder obeys. So it's not truth that has a relativity. 
It is that sometimes I stand in a different relationship between the cause of my knowledge or lack of knowledge or some of that nature. But I want to press the idea that truth itself is not relative. And the humanistic approach of that is dangerous. And it's in the church more than sometimes I like to see. At the end of that result is that people say that there is no right or wrong. Joseph Fletcher, who thought that God is dead, and some of these fellows would uh, say that any sin that you wish to commit is all right if it's right for you. If I remember correctly, Joseph Fletcher has said that if he and his daughter were cast up on after a shipwreck on a desert island, if they were going to be there for an extended period of time, it would be right for him to have sexual relations with his daughter because of the circumstances. That situation is. And that's ugly. And that's what people would say about it. And they said, well, if I were back home, you see, and if I were in a situation where I could have the normal outlets for these things, then it would be wrong for me to do that. But under a different set of circumstances, under this situation, it would be all right for me to do that. And what he's saying is there is no right or wrong except as I see right or wrong. And what I'm trying to say here very clearly is there is an objective truth that is always true regardless of my circumstances. And that truth is true because it is a revealed word of God. God spoke. And when God spoke, He revealed truth. It is truth outside of me. It is an absolute standard. It has not changed from generation to generation. What is true for me was true for my great grandfather. What is true for me was true for all those who live under the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it defines right or wrong. We have a lot of trouble in our day because our schools have decided they can't teach morals. Now I'm going to tell you, what's taking place today and tonight in UTA and the immorality that's on the campus is because there's become a vacuum and there's no morality being taught at all. And what they're saying is that there's no standard of right or wrong. They deny that the Bible teaches what's right or wrong. Now somebody said, well, what makes a thing right or wrong? Because God said so. And that's why God said so. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, to avoid fornication, let a man have his wife, and let a woman have a husband. And that's the proof of the matter. And when somebody wants to suggest that you can go out and have fornication, commit fornication outside of marriage, or without marriage, or however you want to do it, because they say there's no such thing as a standard of right or wrong. It is a denial of the objective, absolute truth of Almighty God. And if I'm ever going to understand God, if I'm ever going to understand the Bible, I must understand that there is a definition of right or wrong. A thing is right or wrong, not because somebody votes on it, not because I can see the practical truth of it, or because somebody disagrees, obviously it's the best policy. That has nothing to do with it. God says a thing is right, or God says a thing is wrong, and that comes from His nature. And the Word of God has to be consistent with the nature of God. In 1 John chapter 1, where, where John says that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all, you have basically in the Greek a double negative. But in the English, a double negative might be for granted. But in the Greek, it was for emphasis sake. And what John was saying, that in God there is not any darkness at all. The point is that when God speaks, the word that comes from God takes on the nature and the character of God and of the Bible. If I really want to know what right is, if I want to know what wrong is, I've got to tune my ear to the word of God and God will tell me what's right or wrong. And from that there is no appeal. There's no appeal at all. Doesn't make a difference in the Episcopal Church is going to meet in some holy and high convocation and say that it's all right for homosexuals to be made priests. God never abdicated. He didn't give them the right to rewrite the rules. The standard right and wrong has not changed because God has never left His throne, my friends. And what makes that thing wrong is because God says it's wrong. And I will never see the practicality of it. If I never see the danger of it, it's still wrong if God says it's wrong. There's no appeal from that. And so we have these denominations going to be in council. And they're going to rewrite the rules. They're going to tell you that some things that past generations have practiced, 
uh, are now going to be wrong. And they're going to tell you that some things they used not to practice and they used to blush when they talk about are now going to be right. And the <coughs> result is there is no sure truth whatsoever. And what's wrong with America today is that people don't understand truth. And a generation of people are growing up without the sure standard of truth. Now just an example of that is Dr. Spock. Dr. Spock wrote his book that a whole generation of people raised their kids by. And according to Dr. Spock, the Bible was outdated. He disagreed with the principles of God's Word, but the Bible says about child rearing, Dr. Spock disagreed with that. I'm glad that I lived long enough to see in print a statement from Dr. Spock that he was wrong. He finally admitted he was wrong. But the terrible tragedy that is that we lost the generation of young people, they don't really understand not only the Dr. Spock in the, in the nursery, but the ones like him in the classrooms and the universities have told the kids they can come to school and they can do anything they want to do. And our young people in middle school are being taught about sex and the practice of sex as though it's the normal sort of thing outside of the marriage laws of God. And the end result, it's no surprise. It's no surprise to see what a mess our country has come to. It's no surprise to find out that the homes are in trouble. It's not surprising to find out that the criminals are being put to death that in my Romans 13. And you just go on and on with the fact that the country's in trouble because the absolute truths of God's Word have been denied in our generation. And I know that the answer to these problems is to preach the Word of God. Now somebody says, oh, that's very simplistic. So be it. So be it. I hear a lot, and I'm not opposed, I said earlier week, I'm not opposed to marriage counseling at all. But I'm going to tell you, there's not a marriage counselor working in salt that can help your marriage unless they build their suggestions and advice on what the Bible says. I am not a marriage counselor. I tell people plainly, I'm not a marriage counselor. And I always dread it when somebody comes to me and says, Brother Roberts, would you come over and talk to my wife and I because I know before I get through, both of them will be mad. It's happened almost every time, and I dread it. But a marriage counselor with all his degrees can never tell them one thing more than I can tell them except for practical matters and how they're trained in some procedures and things. Except by what the Bible tells them about love for one another and respect for one another and putting Christ in their lives to rule their home. And anybody who finally helps a troubled marriage has to somehow get back to the principles contained in God's Word. And they may give them some fancy names. But that's what it's going to be, fine. What I'm trying to make here is that the Word of God is objective, not subjective. It is true the way God has revealed it. And we need to be able to understand it the way God has understood it. Now then, when we then try to understand the Word of God, I believe that human reasoning is used in the Word of God. And I've had a preaching brother tell me, I don't believe that approved apostolic examples and divine implications are part of the divine way of understanding the Bible because human reasoning is required, you see. And your reasoning may be different from my reasoning. Therefore, we can't all understand the Bible alike. We try to follow by examples and by inferences. And the only way we can really believe anything alike is to just take the commands of the Bible. Well, I knew when I heard that the first time. I knew when I heard that the first time. Milo Hadwin, who was a student of ACU, wrote a book in which he denied that approved apostolic examples of any kind were binding and that divine implications and necessary inferences were to be bound upon brethren. And he said the reason why we can't bind those is because it requires human reasoning. And I knew at the time, and finally it's come out, he also recognized, but then said in the book at that time, that commands also require human reasoning to find out which commands are bound upon us. And now then, there are preachers, preachers out here preaching, as one man did two years ago in Nashville, Tennessee, that we all just forget about the epistles and just read the Gospels and do what Jesus did. And that was his argument. Just forget the epistles. And he said, in fact, I recommend that for a few years, we just suspend studying the epistles. And all our Bible classes and all our reading, let's just read the Gospels and just love everybody like Jesus did. 
Now, I don't have that strike to you. But if you don't see the danger in that, we need to talk some more about that. You know, Jesus did a lot of things as a Jew. He lived and died as a Jew. And we were just going to do what Jesus did, then we're going to go back under the law of Moses again. But the whole idea is that we cannot do these things because it requires human reasoning. May I suggest to you that when God wrote the Bible, He addressed it to human reasoning. God did not write His Bible to angels. He didn't write the Bible to dogs, and the fish, and the trees. He addressed His creature, man. And He addressed it to the level of man. You know, I'm talking to Pentecostal people. They're always talking about these tongues. They break out all this gibberish. You ever watch some of these fellows on television that break out the gibberish? And you say, well, what kind of a tongue is that? Oh, that's the, that's the language of angels. Did you ever read the Bible and realize that when God spoke to angels, He always used human languages? What is an angelic tongue? The Bible doesn't describe angelic tongues. When God spoke to man, God spoke to man that man could understand. When angels spoke to men, angels spoke to men in a language men could understand. And all this gibberish that somebody's breaking out in is simply that. A bunch of gibberish. It's not angelic language. It's not a Bible tongue. If you'll go back to the New Testament, look at Acts chapter 2, you'll find out what the tongues are of the New Testament. The tongues of the New Testament were human languages that by a miracle the apostles could speak because the Holy Spirit gave them the power to speak in those tongues. But the tongues were heard, the Bible says, in the language wherein we were born. So when people start, start talking to me about the Bible requires human reasoning, therefore we never can understand the Bible alive. I just remind you that God addressed His Word to human reasoning. Furthermore, the Bible says again in Ephesians 5, 17, Be not foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. Again, Ephesians 3, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, When you read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ. I can know exactly what the Apostle Paul knew about the kingdom. I can know exactly what the Apostle Paul knew about uh, morality. I can know exactly what the Apostle Paul knew about worship in the church. I can know because it's been revealed. And God didn't reveal it in the clouds. And it's some kind of a mantra or whatever it is that we're supposed to uh, sit around and hum. Sit around and hum. And maybe get some kind of a message. Well, that is what the Bible is understood. The Bible just doesn't teach that way. There are commands in the Bible. And those commands are spoken with regard to human reasoning. For example, when this man, first of all, Milo Hadman, said that these two things had to be crossed out of the Bible, and only commands or express statements could be accepted as authoritative, I wondered about the Ten Commandments. Are the Ten Commandments bound upon us today? Now, I'm going to have to reason a bit about that. Pardon me while I reason a bit. Because I don't know then if the Ten Commandments are bound. If all the commands of the Bible are bound upon me, then I've got some things to think about. Do I tithe? Uh, do I, should I bring in some kind of an altar and offer lambs and goats and pigeons and doves? So you, you can read your Bible and there are a lot of commands in the Bible. And one of the commands is go in and possess this land. So maybe we've got to go over and possess Israel again. And you read uh, some of the commands of the Bible, and you find all sorts of things being taught, like Abraham and Noah, Bill and Ark. And the fact of the matter is that when I will have him wrote his book, he wasn't as far then as he was yet to go. Because now he would say that even the commands require human reasoning, and so we're not really bound by commands. Don't worry about the do's and the don'ts of the Bible. Just do like Jesus did, down in just loving one another. When I first started preaching, I had to deal with Baptist preachers who said, it doesn't make any difference what you do if you're honest and believe. Now I'm finding bread in our old days that are teaching the same thing. I got a bulletin from Virginia not very long ago, featured as a front page of that bulletin that, that's for sale, you have to have a subscription to buy it. It was an article by a young man from Fort Worth who said there's no such thing as false doctrine. False doctrine is an unscriptural term. 
And the only way that you can tell a false teacher is by whether or not he's dishonest. Now that presents me the problem. How about you? Because I haven't learned how to read heart yet. And I'm not even able to tell among those who agree with me whether their heart will lie with God or not, much less those who disagree with me. And his position is that the only way you can tell a false teacher is if he's dishonest or insincere. And the result of that is that I never know right or wrong. And that's what they're striving at. Their idea is to change the structure of the church, change the worship of the church, change everything about the church. And these are not people that are over in Timbuktu, over in Nigeria, over in Hong Kong. These are brethren who are considered by men to be sound gospel preachers who are in the process of changing their reasoning about how we understand the truth. And it's a dangerous situation because the papers are among us and being taught by people and they're questioning how we understand the truth. And they're saying that there's no such thing as false doctrine unless a person is dishonest or insincere. And I'll tell you that creates an impossible situation to be you. Because unless I'm like the Lord and I can read hearts, I cannot know whether someone is insincere or not. And so what they're saying is that false doctrine is never determined by the content of the message. False doctrine is only taught by the content of the heart. Well, how far are we going to go with that? Whose ox is going to be going? You see, they're talking about those within the church now. Those that are within the church in, in their heart. What about my Baptist friends? I've got some friends who are Baptists who are very sincere people. I don't question their honesty at all. I think they're wrong. But if I'm going to apply within the church that I can only know somebody to be a, a, a false teacher when they teach something that's insincere and dishonest in their heart, why don't I make that same application or my baptism? <coughs> and that's what they've been saying for centuries. And therefore, the reason why they're so eaten up with error is because they say that I think it'll be wrong if you're dishonest in it. And I am so surprised to hear my own brethren getting to teach them. How do we understand the truth? What makes the doctrine false? It's false, my brethren, when it violates the clear teachings of the Word of God. And the Word of God is understandable. First of all, there are commands and statements in the Word of God that are directly applicable to us. And I must be willing to obey those commands. There are some approved apostolic examples. Examples that I will follow because I find the apostles under the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit that were doing these things. And I know that's right because they did so. And I look at their examples and I follow those examples. And there are some implications that I think I have to follow because God requires of us that we also make some, uh, some conclusions about some things. For example, when we start talking about this business of implications or understanding things that are suggested by God that draws a conclusion. Let's turn with the please to Matthew chapter 22. People say, well, now, now Brother Robert, you can't buy the implications. That is, God implies a thing and I must infer that. Now Guy Woods and a lot of brethren like that have said to the years that in Rule Lemons before he died, Rule Lemons says, I'm afraid of your inferences. Because you're going to try to bind your inference upon me. Let me be clear. We do not bind our inferences on anybody. When God implied a thing, for me to properly understand that truth that God implied in His Word, I must infer or pull from that truth only what God placed in there, and it is God's implication, not mine. Now, to show that the Bible uses that procedure to teach truth, in Matthew chapter 22, beginning of verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, these individuals who did not believe in the resurrection, and they, let's go back a few verses. Have you ever seen anybody who put together a hypothetical case and that they believe that they have given the unanswerable dilemma to someone? These people came to Jesus and they thought they had presented him with the unanswerable question. I'm sure it was famous among the Jews of their day. In verse 24, they came to him and said, Teacher, Moses said that the man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, the third, even to the seventh. 
Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, oh, that fits the spring. There's an unanswerable question on him. I can see their mind grinding. They sat back in a little private room somewhere. They said, we've got to find something that Jesus can't answer. And here's this famous riddle. This famous hypothetical case. Now, hey, let's bring this in on. That conspired. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. I can see their smile as they sat back and waited for them to be confused. Jesus answered and said to them, You're mistaken. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection, now then Jesus is going to imply something. And he's going to hold people accountable. God rebukes these people because they didn't understand what was implied, not stated, not stated, but implied in the scriptures. Concerning the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Now here's what God said. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Well, so what? So what? He says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now then, Jesus inferred that. That's not stated. That's what Jesus inferred. The implication was stated, verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And all the world that Jesus says, you ought to have known that there's a resurrection. Because God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And what that says is that God is going to hold us accountable for what God has implied that I should have used human reasoning to infer. <coughs> And that's the way the Bible teaches. Now that's not obscure. And that's not trickery. That's simply that God makes some statements at times that I can clearly see as commandments. And there are times when God makes an implication about some things. But the implication is so clear that God expects me to infer the truth out of that and will hold me accountable when I don't. And I can avoid implications. They're there in the Scriptures. Furthermore, there are some necessary inferences in the scripture. And uh, when you look at the necessary inferences, I'm not talking about somebody binding their opinions. I'm not talking about somebody just reaching out here and speculating about some things and saying everybody's got to agree with me. I'm talking about the fact that there are some necessary things that we need to understand with regard to the, the things that are there and obey them. And here's some of you. You've got, you've got an implication and necessary inference. Look at the examples that are given. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul said, Be you followers of, be, be you, uh, followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Be you followers of me. Well, how do you know how to follow Paul unless you watch him? And that's the idea. He's an example. He goes further. 1 Corinthians 4, 16, I beseech you, therefore, be you followers of me. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things, he said, were our examples. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Jesus left us an example that you should follow in his steps. Philippians 3, verse 17. So even as you have us for an example, that we're not good news. I know that not every example is to be followed and emulated, but every example teaches something. And when I see Judas betray Jesus with an unholy kiss, I don't want to do that. I, you know, human reasoning says that some things are good and some things are bad. And God knows that I can tell the difference. And so when there are examples in the Bible of things that are evil, I understand because my mind can grasp that and God is saying avoid that. But when you see the holy apostles, and when you see the saints of the first century engage in practices that are approved by the, by the apostles and their presence and by the Holy Spirit, by the Scriptures, then yes, we ought to follow those. Now, let me sum up some of the things that I've said. This is not a high-quality chart. I hope that you'll be able to see it and understand it. The use of human reasoning and understanding the Bible is on this premise. First of all, God created man 
with inherent reasonability. I'm not saying anything new. I'm just saying that God made us the way we are. And he addressed his revelation to us the way we are. Benjamin Franklin, of the old pioneer preaching fame, some one time preached a sermon. He said a book of his sermons. And he said, the title of it was that man, the Bible, the Bible as God gave it, is addressed to man as he is. That he may become what God would have him to be. Now, that'll preach. The Bible as it is, that is simply the inspired word of God. That is, there's no, no ecstatic kind of charismatic operation that emanates from the scripture. Just the Bible the way it is. The Bible the way it is was given to man as he is. He's not predestinated. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit operating in heart. Just man the way that he is. Man with his native ability. Can understand the Bible and be what God would have him to be. And all that saying is exactly what I've said here. That God's message is addressed to the ability that God built into me to know right from wrong. I believe that that's the truth of the matter. Man then must use reason to understand the Bible. Isaiah 1 verse 8, 18. Come ye, that's reason to get us at the Lord. Other passages. So then God has spoken. God has spoken with regard to a total revelation. There is nothing missing from the Bible. God did not leave one iota out. We have the truth that God wants us to have. A total revelation. It is objective truth and will be the truth. If I burn my Bible tonight, that doesn't change the truth of God. If I, like Jehoiakim, take a pen knife and cut out pages of my Bible, that doesn't change the truth of God at all. It's objective. And it is understandable. It is understandable through the use of direct statements or commands, through approved apostolic examples, and by divine implications or necessary instances. Now, when I look at that revelation, reason studies it and evaluates and seals and comprehends. And I recognize there's some incidentals in the Bible, and I'm able to comprehend an incidental from a necessity. Then when the apostles met in an upper room, or when the disciples met with Jesus in the upper room to take the Lord's Supper, that the upper room is an incidental. Now, how can I be sure about that? Because in John 4, Jesus loosed the place. And therefore, because I can reason from John 4, to the fact that they were in an upper room, that the upper room was just incidental, I don't mind that we have to have an upper room to have the Lord's Supper. Well, see, that's reasonable and based upon the Scripture. Not only that, but there's some historicals that do not apply. The Ten Commandments do not apply tonight. Why do I know that? Because of Galatians chapter 5, the book of Hebrews, many passages in the New Testament, the patriarchal age. Is not what we're in tonight. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is what we live under. And so I make some other conclusion that the universal moral code that some talk about doesn't apply. Whatever it might have been, and yet to be defined by some of it still doesn't apply today because we're under the law of Christ that is full and complete. And there's some things that are not relevant, though they were for a time, such as tongue speaking and miraculous prophesying. <coughs> We don't have the age of miracles today. And I look at the Bible and I recognize there's some incidentals that don't apply because I can reason. God gave me that ability. He addressed his revelation to my reason. And I can see some incidentals and I can see some historicals and I can see some non-relevance and I don't walk by those rules because I can see from God's word they don't apply. But when I get through, what's left is the faith. You three. Fully delivered and bound upon me. I stand on the obligation of God's word because God has spoken to me. He has spoken a total revelation. He has told, sp spoken objective truth. And I can understand it because God told me to. And the end result is that I proceed. The faith it is understandable. It is authoritative. It is unifying. And yes, it is identifiable. I can understand and identify the truth of the gospel. There was a New Testament church. I can read about it. I can identify it tonight. And I then either obey or disobey. The truth is revealed. I stand here tonight telling you with all confidence that God has spoken. And he spoke it in an understandable way. And I'm going to be held accountable to the word Jesus spoke. John 12, 48. 
And I know that when I get to the judgment day, I'm not going to stand there and let Joseph Fletcher intercede for me. I'm not going to have the situation ethics advocates there telling God how to run the judgment. They're going to be in the same boat I'm in. They're going to be judged by the word of Christ. And I know that now. And when I learned that, I'm way ahead of getting Maybe tonight there's some of you here that are not Christians. If you're going to be Christians, my friend, you've got to learn the Bible. Where the seed has not gone, life does not go. Hebrews, uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. The seed is the word of God. You've got to study the Bible. You've got to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you have the promise of God that when you do that, you'll be feeble. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight. Our meeting has come to a close. Trust and pray that if you're not a Christian, you understand it. That you must have faith in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized tonight and call the remission of your sins. The child of God has gone straight. Come back home. This church needs you. God wants you. He'll forgive you. He'll you repent and pray for forgiveness. But it's more you to come. I'll stand together while we sing the song selection. Won't you come?